taking a bit time before going to live. Cool. So, yes, ready? <laughs> Almost there. Okay, so I think we are broadcasting now. Or even not minute, uh, it is taking a bit time before going to live. So let us start. And Alan, over to you, right? That is a good start. Can I check who we've got here? I can't see Avi or Ben. Avi yeah. here. Yeah. Excellent. I know, good. And um, obviously, he's been on a lot today because I've caught some of his presentations. Um, excellent. So, uh, we. this is a working session. That's uh, first and foremost. This is not a... Um, this is not a lecture. It is not a one-way uh, communication stream. The clue is in the word communication and indeed working session. So it is intended to be an exchange of ideas such that we come out of this session with more than we went into it. Um, I hesitate to use the groupthink piece because um, that, that's perhaps a little too uh, uh, avant-garde, but it is very much a collaborative and a working session. So I'd just like to set that up at the start. Um, but it is very much focused, and this is as much me to learn, as to how we apply Simon's thinking around Wardley maps to improve our risk-based decision-making. Um, and I know there are going to be some on this call, and I'm kind of looking at Phil at this point with his ORAC hat on, who will suggest that risk is not the place to start. Uh, that's uh, perhaps uh, uh, an item we will discuss. But I certainly like the idea of using a Wardley map to communicate strategy such that the business makes better decisions than it has done in the past. Uh, and I think we're probably going to share some, uh, I will call them war stories because that's my own background, but we're going to uh, share some business scenarios, some case studies, um, if you will, certainly some examples as to how things have worked and have not worked. And then Simon, I think you're going to guide us as to how we can apply that into your mapping system. Um, remembering that uh, you don't necessarily, if I caught it correctly earlier, need a map to use the Wardley system. Simon, can I just uh, draw you into that to keep me straight? Because I'm very much new though to the Wardley mapping approach. Sure, no, not a problem at all. So um, I, I, I will try and do whatever I can is the answer. <laughs> So I, I particularly liked your contrast between the view earlier, sorry, this is when I was listening to your keynote this morning, the view earlier that public sector is not good at this. Uh, and I think you had an example of some 130 odd duplicate processes, but then you contrasted that with financial services, a particular uh, client who had over 1100. Over so a public sector. So public sector is not necessarily bad at this, which are, which is good, actually. Now, I've, I've worked both sides of the fence, so I think that's, that contrast is useful. What I haven't seen so much, and I know we do have an international presence on the audience, is how the UK practice compares with other countries. Um, I'm afraid my orientation has been very much towards Germany, the Americas and the UK, but there are other approaches, and I think we'd like to bring those into the conversation if at all possible. Um, Simon, again, can I draw you into that in terms of how much um, how much adoption of your approach has there been beyond the UK when it comes to the sort of decision making that we're trying to apply um, in cybersecurity, or is that too narrow? So okay. first of all, so um, for, uh, a there are map camps in the UK, in the US, in Spain, in Brazil. And various other places. I know that mapping is taught at Moscow Institute of Technology, at uh, Harvard Kennedy School, um, uh, the government school, uh, that uh, it's even at places like LSE in London and UCL in London. I used to teach at Judges as well, and there's various other places, as in you often do a, a one day session on it. So it's spread into all sorts of different areas. When we talk about the duplication, um, 
the um, and <laughs> um, so it was an international bank, and shall we just say um, it's not actually primarily associated with the UK. Uh, and uh, when I talk about pharma companies, um, uh, 350 teams building an enterprise content management system, that is not a UK pharma company. Now, that doesn't mean that UK is good. Uh, there is lots of waste and duplication, as we know. Um, I don't think it is confined solely to the UK. I think it's pretty much widespread everywhere. Um, now, just to go to the point about the government, is because everybody always you know, likes to pick on government as an example of waste. And to be brutally honest, the levels of waste that I've seen in government are not comparable to the levels of waste that I see in the private sector. Um, the main difference is in government, you have things like the major projects authority and the National Audit Office, which actually goes and does inspection on projects and then publishes fairly hefty reports, sometimes good, sometimes damning. Uh, in the private sector, what we tend to have is the magic carpet. So when a project is going horribly wrong at a cost of many, many hundreds of millions, if not billions, we lift up the magic carpet and sweep it under. <laughs> so the, uh, um, I, I, I suppose our exposure uh, to, to failure is more acute uh, when it comes to government because we tend to, you know, talk about this stuff and, and make, 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 make people aware of this stuff, whereas private sector doesn't tend to do a good job on that, unless it gets caught out by journalists or something, so like the sort of security area. You can't hide from that. Did that help answer the question? Yes, yes, it does. No, that's that, thank you. And I've seen that. I mean, I, I, I spent the first 20 years of my career in the military field. So um, I have read with interest both while serving and since the national audit reports on the Ministry of Defense mm -hmm. uh, and, and some of their shocking equipment programs. Uh, and I've been at the sharp end when um, the equipment that the troops in the field need has not been there. and We've had to accept more risk than we were comfortable with, but I know it's improved since. So, uh, but, e but even then, defence procurement still makes mistakes. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, so, um, I mean, defence procurement is a really interesting, fascinating space. Um, if you look at the US Air Force and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Ward, I talk about uh, uh, fire, um, so fast and expensive, restrained and elegant. That actually came out of the US Air Force. It was the FIST program, fast and expensive, simple and tiny. So um, when they built the, um, uh, uh, it's um, which is the plane, Harvest Hawk, it's a, it's a, um, it was a combat aircraft uh, carrier, basically. Um, which the Hornet? Oh, I, um, no, 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 it's... Um, boom, 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 boom. Um, so, so the current one is the F-35 Lightning, but I think you're talking further back, are you not? Yeah, so this was the Harvest Hawk, actually. And let me get the details of it. Hang on a second. Did, oh, did, okay, the Global Hawk. Um, it was a Marine uh, Combat. UAB. No, 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 no. It's a um, actually, a, a, it's basically a troop and equipment carrier. And let's have a look. Was it called the Harvest Hawk? I thought it was. Uh, I'm just... Harvest Hawk Marine Combat. Do, 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 my internet is really, really slow. Ah, right. Uh, Lockheed Martin KC 130. Harvest Hawk. Uh, but it's a variation of the, um, uh, the Hercules. Uh, as, uh, so basically, when the, um, the, the FIST program, they needed a, um, a troop carrier, an equipment carrier uh, for the Marines in, in the US. And under the FIST program, what they realized is they could reposition, uh, a, a, I believe it is a, uh, it's based upon a, a Hercules, uh, but they added various other equipment capabilities to it as well. And the entire program went from paper to combat operations, I think in about 18 months. So it was a pretty fast process. And this is um, what they wrote up in the FIST program. You'll have to look up 
uh, fist, US Air Force, fast and expensive, simple and tiny. And um, what I like about it was the concept that they, they broke it down. They, they tried to understand what is actually required, what are the needs, and they broke it down into small components and looked at, all right, how do we build this inexpensively and quickly? And most of it was about, well, what we want to use is standard commodity like components wherever possible. And because the normal approach is, you know, um, to make something very, very uh, or specific and specify to the nth degree and it's taken incredible amounts of time and, and cost. And so, so they took a different approach. So I will have to dig it out. It's a long time since I've looked at it. But the, um, what I like about it is when we talk about aircrafts, um, if we look at the, 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 the space now, you've got to China, which has gone down the path of basically 300,000, you know, fairly commoditized drones, because they've worked out that it's, you know, it's a game of economics. It's much more effective and efficient to build a defensive system. And I read about this about six years ago, seven years ago, something, uh, using large numbers of cheap drones, and which is what they've done. Which, of course, you know, from a point of view of you're doing procurement, uh, it makes a little bit of, um, you know, if you're, you're in a mindset of we need an ever more. Um, um, I watched the disaster. The disaster is the is the F thirty five. It's we we need to build the fighter which copes with almost all situations, and it's just mushroom out of um, uh, well, I mean, the cost is fairly explosive. But, you know, we're knocking military here and knocking government. And I think that's a really bad idea because even though I have seen expensive programs, it's nothing compared to what I see in the private sector. And to give you an example, I sat there with a telco in 2011 and they showed me their private cloud. They were going to build this private cloud. They had started, it was a project. And they were going to spend just over a billion building their own private cloud. And, you know, we'd already shifted towards, you know, compute becoming a utility. And by private cloud, what they basically mean is we're going to have more of the same in the past, the data center and a whole bunch of servers, but we're going to pretend it's like the future. Um, so they showed me this billion effort. And I, I, I told them I could give them the same effect for about 25 million. To which they said, how would you do that? And I said, simple. You pay me 25 million. Uh, I will sit on a beach for five years drinking margaritas. And then I'll phone you up at the end and say we failed. And that way you'll have saved all the rest of the money. And of course, they were not impressed by this. And so um, they, and they never hired me again. Um, but they went and spent the money. And I talked to one of the execs um, several years after, you know, you know um, about seven, eight years after this. And uh, they spent over a billion. And it has been a total you know, waste of money, a disaster. Um, but of course, people have moved on and people have moved on uh, to ever more glorious jobs based upon the fact that they built this, spent this billion uh, doing <laughs> things which were useful. Um, and of course, it's just it's buried and hidden and not talked about. So, um, yeah, I, yes, disasters or problems happen in government and military as well. Um, but I, I prefer to... to um, uh, concentrate on the private sector solely because um, I mean, the disasters tend to be bigger. Anyway, I'll shut up. I'm too much of a rant for me. But for the Harvest Hall, uh, the chap is Lieutenant Colonel Dan Ward, and it's the FIST program, fast and expensive, simple and tiny. It's got the story in there, um, uh, US Air Force. And it was all about how they they they, they got a new, basically, it's a, it's a true carrier, where well, it's a Hercules, a modified version of Hercules, and how they went from paid in combat operations in like 18, 18 months, I think it was, which is like super, super fast, but anything in military. Anyway. No, thank you for that. Um, Pleasure. And there are, there, are, there are some lessons there, I suspect, that we need to apply in the cybersecurity space so that we don't repeat those, um, I'm going to call them failures, those, those less effective uses of money. Um, but I have to say, I haven't seen your Wardley map system used so far. And I've been in the commercial side for 50, 14 years now. Yeah. So I'm very much coming into this new. But I know the likes of Denis and others have used it. Yeah. But what I, what I still see as I'm around the bazaars as, a, as an independent consultant these days yeah. is a lot of spending on tools. 
Yeah. You know, I don't I don't necessarily want to call them shiny bits of tin and, and flashing lights, but there is an element of that. Yeah. Without enough thought to what the effect is going to be of those. And to me, that's where I can see using your mapping approach provide some focus onto that. Okay. I think you start to use the, the, the labels of products and utilities mm -hmm. and I suppose commodities to some extent. Uh, in my old world, I'd have called them effects and tools and procedures. But I can see how I, I could use the Wardley mapping to illustrate that. Mm -hmm. um, have, have, have you seen that used well as yet in the cybersecurity sphere? Uh, and I'd like to accentuate the positive rather than the negative if you've got an example but, um, i can see phil's come up so perhaps we give you a break and give phil a chance to chip in well, well i suspect he'd like to so just to, before before you dive into that just to say just to answer the question about how common is it i mean remember i started using this in 2015 and i used this successfully for me um but i i, I really didn't occur to me for at least six years uh, that people weren't mapping. I, I, I talked about it. I assumed everybody had another way of doing it. And then, of course, I found out they, they hadn't. So how common is it? Oh, it's still very rare. I mean, I've got uh, uh, venture capitalists who use it for all their startups. I've got uh, um, uh, there's people in government and different parts of government that use it. But, you know, it's a commonplace. No, it's rare. Okay, good. That means I'm not behind the drag curve. That's a good, always a good thing to do, but I definitely want to learn. So, um, Phil, can I draw you in? Did you have something to say on the topic? You're on mute. You're on mute, Phil. Oh, your speaker's not plugged. Oh, your microphone's not plugged in. How's that? Sounds good. Yeah, you're good, Phil. Okay, sorry, my uh, my DAC is playing up. Okay, um, so security. Uh, we are defined by vendors, which means we're defined by v v uh, VCs. Uh, so the vendors tell us what our problems are, and they sell us our solutions. We've not worked out what value is in security. So we also have no idea if we're delivering any value. And we avoid feedback loops like crazy because there's so much uncertainty. We don't know we're doing the right thing. And everybody then doesn't measure because otherwise we might get caught out not doing the right thing. So I think we're in a worse place than most businesses. If you were thinking about a broader business strategy, because at least they've got a set of accounts that sooner or later hold somebody to account. <laughs> we don't. You know, we, we have the CISO merry-go-round. We have everybody buying from their vendor, shipping on either just before or just after a major breach, and then buying from their vendors again. Um, and, you know, I might be being a bit uh, aggressive about this, but I think we are so much floating in space that I, I, I don't, I'm not even sure how to map our way out right now. You know, even just a core definition of what is the value of security evades us. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no need to apologize for that at all. I, I knew I'd get something out of you along those lines. So thank you for living up to my expectation. Um, I, I think I agree with you. I think measures of effectiveness is certainly something I've struggled with and I've, and I've worked at a number of outfits over the last 10 years. I haven't actually seen it done well yet. Um, and I've also been part of that merry-go-round. So yes, I'm guilty as charged, I'm afraid. Where I perhaps do... Um, take a slightly different perspective to yourself is around, we are told by the vendors what we should buy. I think there's an element of the vendors are very much driving the conversation, but I would suggest that's because the end users aren't strong enough with what their requirements are. And I think we, you've got something particularly um, accurate when you say we avoid that feedback loop um, I think there's a there's a psychology element in there because we're because we know there's a risk and because we can't or we choose to say that you can't guarantee security, we kind of put it into that corner and don't really want to shine the light onto it. Um, 
Would you agree with that or would you counter that, Phil? Uh, or indeed, Tony, do you want to come into that? Because I suspect you have something on the topic as well. So, Tony, first up. We have a lot of comments in the chat. <laughs> yeah, there's a fair few going on there. Um, I would say there's, there's also the problem, I think, with a lot of organisations don't necessarily know what they want or what they need. Um, and therefore, the vendors are quite happy to fill in the gaps for them. Um, you know, I'd but, agree with that, but uh, if I may, Tony, that's my point about the end users don't write their requirements well enough. No, exactly. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, you can, I think you can map some of this stuff. I've done maps around from attacker perspectives to work out areas to prioritise investment and controls in. Um, I've also done things like using uh, mapping, broadly mapping to horizon scan, um, parts of the sort of you know, security consultancy industry. Um, and I did that to the point where I depressed myself by working out that um, there wasn't a much left that wouldn't be industrialized. Because <laughs> um, everything's getting better and pushing into the industrial space. And uh, you know, the consultancy bit was basically getting squeezed down more and more. Initially, it looked like GRC was going to be the only bit left, but then we worked out with the, you know, Compliance as code, then kill, you know, put the last peg into that bit. So I think um, ultimately, <laughs> Simon's plan of getting rid of consultants is working. Insecurity, so, really? Uh, I mean, no, I've got no. to say, how has security consulting got any better in the last fifteen years? It hasn't. <laughs> no, no, it's just been replaced right by. You know, we're industrialising something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was all the, it all the fact that people were finding ways to industrialize elements that pe that consultancies had, um, you know, basically consulted about. And as some of these things, you know, practices and new patterns emerge, and new practices emerge, and elements get industrialized and, and um, automated, etc. The the thing that consultants could consult upon was getting smaller and smaller <laughs> until they could find new things to consult upon. I guess. Well, it's interesting. The new sort of tech first businesses, um, that's where we've seen the innovation. That's where we've seen people who are actually doing the job, working out how to do the job better. And a lot of that is because they measure everything. And so they can see when it works. So when we talk about innovation in cyber, you know, with respect to many of the startups, they're not the ones coming up with these ideas what they are doing is commercializing things that are being developed in-house in tech first companies cloud first companies who are working out how to fix their problems uh, and i think there's a very interesting thing that the the vendors and the consultants have innovated nothing in the last 15 years um, and if anything are struggling to work out how to monetize things like compliance as code because they suddenly have realized that there's this um, stalking horse that's going to take away all their spreadsheets um, in terms of my original comment though about vendors telling us what to buy, 15 years ago we had no data. We, you know, we had small groups of people that knew each other who told each other stuff that was going on, and there was nothing in the public domain. You know, you were completely locked down. We are now awash with data. I mean, from now to 15 years ago, the you know, Scientia Institute have just published a database of 200. Uh, reports, vendor reports full of data. We have more data about cybersecurity than we know what to do with. Almost all, of it, well, almost all of it is sponsored by vendor marketing departments. And while they might not necessarily be saying, hey, CISO, here's your strategy, what they are saying is, here's a whole bunch of money to market a problem that we found a load of data, weirdly enough, that says our product solves it. And, and actually, we're being driven by these data reports that, in theory, are giving us insight into our problems, whereas, in fact, what they're giving us is insight into how we're going to spend our budget for the next five years. Somehow, we need to step back from this vendor-led problem. We need to sit back and say, what are we trying to deliver to our organizations? What is the value we're trying to bring here? Because if we don't know what that is, we'll, all we'll constantly be doing is buying stuff from other people tell us, and then more or less showing that data to the board to say, well, they, you know, this is the data that tells me why I should buy that. Uh, so I'm, I'm nodding my head in violent agreement here, actually. Uh, and I, I just wonder whether, um, rather than working this problem forward, we should actually work the problem backwards. 
So if we decide what the end result should be for the business, and I think Simon, this is where the strategic vision perhaps comes in, which is where the, the your mapping process, I can see how I might use that as a communication vehicle. So uh, I'll, I'll put a hypothesis up. If the if the measurable result for the benefit of the business, to Phil's point about the value return that the business is looking for from its investment in cybersecurity, that should be something like a business that is free to operate in the cyber domain or in its business domain, but largely free from interruption, such that it can concentrate on whatever its main output is from the business sense. That actually goes back to the definition of security, which is where I'm, I'm drawing on, which is that free from inter interference piece. Is that, a, is that an end state that we should go to, or is there a better one? So I, I'm- I'd like to come at it. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna push it. Sorry, apologies. I'm gonna push it in slightly a different direction. And uh, the reason for this is that, um, so we talk about the use of, um, uh, mapping and the security and you know my I have friends at um, uh, Simon Crosby, so at Bromium, uh, Tao Klein's person, a good person to talk to involved in Adlam. So what Adlam did was they mapped out the security industry and used those maps uh, to identify where, to tap, where the gaps were. Uh, I mean they went you know pretty uh, huge rise from nowhere to being bought by Microsoft for about 400 million and uh, in the space of about four to five years. So, so they effectively found an area niche within the market to attack and uh, they used to govern themselves with that. So I think, I think they would argue it it's, uh, would be useful in the same way when I talked about the telco company, I mean, it mapped it out and that's why I was able to explain they were doing something dark, but they decided to ignore it. But now this comes to the real question, what is the value of mapping? Maps really only help you if you're in a competitive space where you have users who have needs which need to be supplied by a chain of components uh, in order to meet those needs. If that is true for your industries, then mapping that industry out will help you identify how to organize yourself, where to spend money, how it's adapting, etc. So that's the first question I would ask. Is security an industry that has users with needs and components within it that meet that are needed to meet those needs because if that is the case the mapping will help if it's not the case well the mapping is not going to help now, if mapping is going to help and you're not using mapping then i would then ask the question how are you determining who your users are what their needs are and what components are actually in that supply chain in the current system does that make sense it does, uh, and I think my my immediate reaction is yes. I think we do fit your definition. Okay. Um, but I think we have to. I'm going to say narrow it to keep the to keep the mapping focused, which is why I'm thinking about what's that end state and work it backwards. Okay. So I'm going to challenge that. Where you what? normally start? I'm going to, I'm going to challenge that. I'm going to ask oh, you. Ask you why do you want to narrow it? Because uh, the reason being, okay. the reason why I want to ask that is if you say, you know, we do have users, we do have needs, there they, they, are capabilities that we need to create to meet those needs, and there are components involved in those capabilities. The first question that we need to ask if we're not mapping, how on earth? are we currently working out what that current environment is and making decisions in this space? Because I accept, okay, we, we can argue about whether maps should be here or what, but let's, let's say that maps are useful because those conditions exist. But the real question is, how are we currently doing it? Uh, I don't think that's a, that's a valid challenge. I think um, Phil was suggesting, and actually I think it was Tony actually, sorry, I'm going to correct that. Tony, I think you were suggesting that we attack it, what I would describe at the tactical end. We look at the threat space, we look at the controls to introduce to make it harder for the attackers uh, to reduce their effectiveness. But it is tactical rather than strategic. Uh, and I think perhaps, Simon, that's where we're missing a trick in a sense, because a lot of the cybersecurity effort 
is at the operational end of the spectrum. Phil, I can see your hand up. Go on, jump in. We have a, a multi-stakeholder problem. So we're not a, we're not pro just providing value to a set of users in a, a classic sense. We have the users, as in the people who buy from us, our customers, our citizens, however we want to describe them. We have our, our owners and our masters, the executives and the boards and the shareholders that sit over them. And we also have a, a social uh, responsibility, which in many cases is enforced by the regulators. In terms of the problem is often being defined by this vendor data, the solution is often being provided by control frameworks. And we are dominated by control frameworks. Um, everything we do is, is lensed through one or other control framework. And I've got to say, control frameworks, they're, they're useful tools. They save you time. But they're written by people in organizations who have time to write standards. These are organizations that tend to be bigger, have a lot of money, and are fairly static in the way they operate which is why none of the control frameworks right now, as far as I'm aware, talks about compliance as code. And yet that is five, six years old now. So control frameworks is useful, but they're not necessarily the right answer if we're looking to define an answer, Simon. No, I, I mean, really good. I'm just gonna come back to you on that. So you've already identified a number of discrete users. We have the business, we have the, uh, the consumers of whatever we're providing. Uh, we have regulators and we also have vendors. Okay. And each of them have needs and like vendors have needs to make revenue and profit. So they'll happily try and keep you trapped in a world of custom building or buying whatever their thing is uh, as much as possible. And so, so you, you, you have to be mindful of that. Uh, we've got the business itself. Um, so we need to identify what are the needs of the business. And, and um, you mentioned executives. So uh, often it's political capital. Basically, I don't care about security as long as I don't end up in the newspaper, something along those lines. Um, you've got the regulators who will have a different set of needs and you've got the end consumers who we really should be focused on. Now, you briefly mentioned those, but then you shot into uh, the, the control frameworks. Um, so the question I, I have to ask, and I'll keep, before we get to the components involved and so forth, where in the security industry, um, you know, if I go to a security group uh, in one company and I just go up to the CISO and I say to them, right, who are your users and uh, what are their needs? And, and is that the sort of information they'll be able to tell me just like that? Not a one. Not one. Uh, I, think, I think you'd get something, but, but yes. not what you're asking for. I think the language would be used differently. Well, yeah, and this is where, so for example, I actually have experience on that one, because I remember actually having a very interesting debate internally, but I want to define customers, and I want to define the customers of security, which a lot of them were internal, and there was a very interesting psychological challenge back or, or strategy that the idea was everything we do has to be driven by the end customer, i.e. the one buying the product. And I kept, my argument was, but our direct customers in security are not the end customer. We serve the ones that serve the end customer. So I think we had a good picture of how to present that. The problem was sometimes the business wanted to see things in a different lens. But I, I felt at least from a security point of view, we were focused on the idea that for example, some of our customers are developers. Some of our customers are DevOps team. Our customers are even management from a reporting point of view. So those are the ones that in a way we serve and we make them secure. And, and I think security, we, we have evolved in the last especially decade with the idea that security is supposed to be an enabler. Our job is to let the business go as fast as they can or they, they're willing to accept the risk within the security boundary. And actually, Phil, is it worth you explaining a little bit that conversation we once had where you talked about the risk sort of threshold and above is too risky and below is we have we have force of attrition yes yeah, so a couple of things uh, first thing i was just going to say is i've actually taken a bit of a view that our job as security is to protect value and protecting value is not only protecting existing value it's about protecting future value so we have to make sure that our existing value engines keep working but we're also able to develop and support new value engines 
and our job is to make sure that that is maximised and that the unexpected in-year expense, as I like to refer to as a security breach, doesn't happen. Um, as to that piece you were talking about there, Dennis, uh, so that we have this horrifying thing that unfortunately was developed by consultancies uh, called risk appetites, uh, which seem to imply that we want to eat risk uh, and we have so much risk we can eat before we get full, uh, which is kind of nonsense. But uh, it's what that has led to in, in finance terms. It makes sense. If you're going to go and invest a hundred million pounds in the market, and you're prepared to, to lose 120 million pounds on the back of what you're investing in, then you have an appetite. It's 120 million pounds. Security doesn't really work that way. Um, and the other thing with a financial appetite is if you're prepared to put 120 million in the market and you only put 80 in, then you've just not taken 40 million pounds worth of opportunity that you were prepared to take. You've left money on the table. So the goal in a financial risk appetite is to run as close to the line as you can without crossing it. The interesting thing about security risk appetite is we are based on this uh, legally derived concept called as low as reasonably possible. And the US has got a different variation on the words so that means the same thing, which basically means you, you define what is an acceptable or unacceptable risk. And then you manage the ones you have down to the point at which they are acceptable. But everybody realizes that that costs a huge amount of money. So what you end up doing is saying, well, it wasn't reasonable that we managed that, you know, the risk of a global pandemic. So as low as reasonably possible, you know, we had some masks and it, it became a legalistic term that allowed you to justify sort of an unacceptable risk that really, let's, let's call it acceptable and we won't worry about it. Um, Risk appetite is a weird concept for security and we don't understand it and everyone uses it differently. At best, I would talk about risk tolerance, how much risk people are prepared to live with, how much loss they're prepared to take before they really want to take action. Um, but it, as a concept, but one of the things that occurred to me, and I saw this in a business I was working in, where the appetite for change in the executive team was huge. They wanted to go out and be as digital as hell. They wanted to do the best thing they could do for their customers. They were changing the environment. They were going crazy and doing all the usual mistakes you make in a digitization program. But the core of the business was one of the most risk averse groups of people I've ever met in my life. And what they had done is they had built a technical environment that you couldn't breathe in. You couldn't move. Um, and what became very clear was that there was a cost, there was a drag, there was a reduction in value that the uh, digital team were, weren't able to generate because the security controls in the technical environment were so strict, they couldn't do these things that everyone wanted to do. So it came to me that, you know, if we're going to have to have this concept of a risk appetite, and that's how much risk we want to take, maybe we need a controls appetite. Maybe we need to understand how much friction are we prepared to take for security? And good security sits somewhere between an appetite and, and an appetite, maybe. Um, coming up with a good definition of what a controls appetite is, is, yeah, not done yet. So just to respond back, I, I totally agree that these all sound reasonable things, but again, I'll come back to the issue. It, it's like when I'm, if I'm building something in business, I, I need to start by focusing on who the users are. And those users may be my consumers, it might be regulators, it might be the business and my board itself. And so I need to identify what are their needs as well, because obviously I want to meet the needs of the consumers in order to get revenue. You know, I need to meet the needs of the regulators in order to be legal. I need to meet the needs of the board in order to keep my position going and re maintain that political capital. Um, so, but I will start from the point of view of trying to understand who the users are, and they may be internal, they may be external, and what their needs are. Um, the rest of it, otherwise, if you don't start at that point, we can never work out, you know, what sort of capabilities, you know, you, you can't get the experts in, hopefully the experts are internal, uh, or, you know, if you're out there, it depends if you're building something novel or new, and some, some bits will be outsourced. But um, if we don't know what the needs are how do we ever get to the point of working out what are the capabilities we're going to need to meet those needs so um i'm not an expert in this space by a long shot but this is the thing which is glaring 
to me. Uh, it need, needs to start. And you're nodding your head as well, Phil. So I, I'm guessing I might be on to something. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely agree. It's, um, it's interesting because we, we've, never, we've never properly identified what our users need. You know, we have a couple of different things, and I suspect it is a, a collection of needs. You know, to some degree, it's avoidance of bad things. To some degree, it's survival and learning from bad things. And to some degree, it's, um, you know, allowing good things despite bad things. You know, there, there, is a, there is a funny sort of balance between different needs that we meet. But, you know, and what, if you go and talk to a CISO, they'll tell you what the needs they believe are. But generally, they will not be a complete set. They'll, you know, either hit, I'm here to stop breaches or I'm here to make sure we're resilient or I'm here to, you know, and they're all related but slightly different ways of thinking about the same problem. I'd, I'd echo that, Phil. But I think, Simon, to your point about who are the users and what are their needs, um, I think Phil actually um, and, and Denis as well identified that we do have a number of user groups. Um, I've, I've been that CISO at a, at a FTSE 100, and I've had multiple stakeholders that I've been facing off to, all with actually diverse interests, whether that's the non-execs keeping an eye on the execs so that they return value to the shareholder, but in a corporately governed, appropriate fashion, uh, because, of course, somewhere in there, the execs are driven by remuneration based on uh, usually on in-year revenue, possibly last year's revenue. But they're very rarely rewarded on, well, what does it look like in five years to avoid that one billion spend that didn't deliver value? So there's that tension at the executive level. But then there's also those internal customers. Sorry, I'm using the term customer rather than user, actually because I think of security as a service um, with multiple customers, you know, whether it is my DevOps team who need guidance around security architecture because they don't think about security in that sense. They're thinking about architecture from a, um, from a user. You know, we talk about the user experience, um, but at the, where I would go with Phil's point about value I think one of our Achilles heels remains that in the value chain as espoused by Professor Michael Porter, security doesn't get a look in, despite the fact that quality and audit and health and safety do. That's always struck me as an odd aberration, which kind of puts us on the back foot to start with, that security isn't seen to be valuable. So we are always in the cost space. And we're always given as little as we as the business can get away with because they don't see value in that internal investment. So and in cybersecurity, we've kind of been riding a wave where they've been throwing money at us, but it's become increasingly difficult for the cybersecurity folks to demonstrate the value gained from that investment. And I think we're struggling right now. Okay. Uh, I am... Um... I have a lot, a lot of sympathy in a way because I, I used to run uh, security a long, long, long time ago for Mohammed Al Fayed and Harrods. Uh, this was back in the uh, uh, very early '90s, different world. Um, but um, so, um, so one of the things is uh, when I look at a map, a map is just uh, uh, stocks of capital, and the lines are exchanges of capital. So, uh, for example, I can map from the point of view of the uh, investors and shareholders. And investors, I'm making investment. I want to return the capital. That is basically that line to the investor, uh, to say uh, a, a, an industry or a specific company. Not an so an investor to a specific company, and that specific company may produce something, um, drug, food, doesn't matter, and that has um, can meet, or hopefully, will meet the needs of some consumers. Um, and this is the thing about value. You you should, well, this ideally, you should create value through meeting the needs of others. Uh, there's one particular area of uh, a rent extraction, uh, which is rather unfortunate. Uh, it's just a, um, an artifact of, uh, you know, uh, um, a ineffective competition in the market. 
Uh, and so the typical example is monopolies and you know telecom monopolies and things like that. Great, they do rent extraction on copper um, because we don't have an effective market. But ideally, you should be creating value through meeting the needs of others. And that doesn't matter whether those customers are internal or external. Um, but I do accept and understand the point if it's always bundled as a cost. There's an interesting perspective from the, the cost thing. And sorry, I'm, I have too many opinions on this stuff. Um, the cost of security goes straight on the bottom line. We're buying things, we're hiring people. Um, and that is a bottom line cost. What a lot of people forget, and the, the reason I refer to security breaches as sort of unexpected in-year expense is so do breaches. Breaches go directly onto the bottom line, but they're not planned. They're not in the CFO's plan for that year. So that 20 million pound, 30 million pound breach comes out of that year's expenditure. Uh, and there is a balancing act, which is we are spending money to protect the business from unexpectedly spending large amounts of money. And ultimately that's what we do. You know, we, we for those of us that work in the commercial world, that work for businesses, our job is to minimize the unexpected expenditure for the least amount of known expenditure. It's that balancing act. I don't think many other people in security think about it that way. They don't think about it as a commercial role in a sense that we're there to look after the bottom line. There's a very small influence on the top line in terms of reputation, but fundamentally we're a bottom line cost control function trying to minimize unexpected expenditure. Um, once you've got that in your head, it does change what the value is you're trying to produce. I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. Sorry, Denis, if I may. Uh, I, I switched on to that when I found myself reporting to the CFO. Uh, and this is over 10 years ago now. And I was sat around a table where only two of us were not financial directors. Uh, and unfortunately, he was the head of procurement. So he was in the numbers game as well. And I had to quite quickly understand, okay, what's my value at risk equation? Do I have one even? And to your point about, yes, I know what my costs are, but where, where am I in the game of adding value into the business is where it, I had a very interesting six months, shall we say, uh, not least because my father's a chartered accountant and I swore I'd never, gonna, never go near annualized loss expectancy and the like. And that's actually what I found myself more and more in but I think the weakness of our risk piece, and I suspect, Phil, you'll agree, and, and, and others probably will as well, is our probability estimate is just a finger in the air. It's, I, I, I'm hesitant, I'm trying hard not to use some language I shouldn't use, but it's, it's almost hocus pocus. The probability piece just has no real semblance in evidence. And we see that all the time. But that's what really undermines our why we cannot guarantee security, because a zero day exploit might well appear after left field. Um, we kind of expect it. We just don't know what it will be. We don't know where it will be, but we do expect one to come out of out of the news cycle, most likely. So that's our weakness. That probability piece is not forecastable. Um, but I do like your point about it is about controlling the costs and trying to keep that operational flex piece to deal with the incidents within manageable limits. Uh, and I think that's where I'd like to see whether anybody has had some successes along those lines, as opposed to what I've seen as difficulties. Um, is there anybody out there who'd like to stick their hand up? Sarah's coming up with some good stuff at the moment in the chat uh, box. Um, if you want to, yeah, talk about it, Sarah. Sarah Clark. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, hang on a sec. I'll just let the other person in the room know I'm speaking now. Yeah, he's gaming in the background. Um, uh, this is um, about the probability. I very much agree, Alan, um, about the finger in the air. But uh, as I talk, when I talked about cyber insurance historically, then um, I realised that we were just lacking tail data it's pure and simply that we nobody's recording uh, incidents and breaches at the level of consistency and and quality that you would need to have tail data to allow forward prediction 
um and and also things you, you need homogenous things and homogenized events to to start to look at risk in that way but we are starting to accumulate it and it's largely happening through the cyber insurers because they have to um establish their loss exposure um in this context of mapping though i i don't actually see um the, the value of mapping in in this more traditional risk context i i see the value of mapping as taking the stuff that's no brainers that we need in terms of controls and processes you know, nobody's not going to have access control. Nobody's not going to have um, some form of governance. Nobody's not going to have some kind of perimeter control. And looking at where the components to implement those things come from, to actually then make it very clear which things are still in the innovation and bespoke space to focus more effort upon those things. Because I think sometimes we don't make space for the more creative stuff because we're still flailing around working out how best to resource and source the things we need for just the baseline no-brainers. We're not actually justifying the amount of people and money we need to get that stuff happening. So, I think I'd agree with pretty much all of that. Uh, yeah. I'm, saying, I'm saying pretty much rather than saying all, actually, I should probably say I agree with all of that. I mean, one of the things to your point about the tail data, uh, I know the actuaries struggle with the limits on data because they like to have 30 years or more data and we haven't been in the game that long yet. But I do think to Phil's earlier point, we are getting more and more data. I just worry that I'm not entirely convinced that the integrity of that data is solid. In other words, I'm not entirely sure that that's good quality data. No, so I think it's going there's to a take challenge in there. ages to settle. Where, where I would disagree, disagree. Where I would perhaps take a different view is over the insurance world. I'd, I'd had some um, contact, close contact with brokers and underwriters and reinsurers in the first half of last year, uh, and I was a little bit disappointed at where <laughs> they were. Um, being slightly myopic in the way that they were looking at things. And there was a tension between the brokers and the underwriters in particular about transparency, where the brokers were not actually wanting to ask the right questions of their customers because it would drive the premium up and the customer would go to a different broker who didn't ask the questions. And the underwriters That's didn't a, seem to have yeah. enough... I'm going to say power, but that's perhaps not the right play. But they didn't seem to have enough um, governance over that broker to customer conversation because of the way the insurance industry is set up. That was certainly my take for my exposure last year. Phil, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Different risks are differently um, analyzable. So everybody dies. The risk of death for everybody on this call is 100%. Getting the characteristics about our lives uh, in order to understand who's going to go first and who's going to go later is eminently doable. Because we know that it's going to happen to everybody. It's going to happen to, you know, the same type of event's going to be, to, to everybody's going to get it, end of life. Um, and over a large population especially if you're providing insurance to a large population, the averages work in your favor as an insurer. The whole point being an insurer understands the risk better than the individual and therefore is able to not only profit, but also provide service to the individual as a result. We're paying them to manage our risk for us. Cyber may get there. However, the cyber domain is an, uh, you know, properly a complex adaptive system. We have multiple actors with different requirements sitting on a landscape that is itself moving, irrespective of the fact that they all have different requirements overlapping and integrating and, and reflecting off each other. Um, whether or not we will get a frequentist model of cyber risk that allows us to predict reliably, I don't know. We're, right now, we operate under a huge amount of uncertainty. The big problem we have is that most people suppress that and therefore nobody realizes we're operating under a high level of uncertainty. Um, we may be able to get rid of that uncertainty and the insurers might be a route to it. But if they are, it's a long way down the path and it's not guaranteed. Um, it's entirely possible that we will have a risk which we will get better and better at predicting like the weather, 
but we still can't really, you know, we can tell you with a good degree of certainty what the weather's going to be like tomorrow and not very strong in six months. Um, and we may see that cyber is a similar thing to the weather. Oh, I hadn't thought about it that way, but yes, I can see that analogy, particularly that works for me with my favoured use of the maritime analogy, the shortest route between A to B is not necessarily a straight line. Um, so we explored that for a while on the weather because one of the problems I was struggling with was how do you descri describe events that we know are coming but are not here? And then the analogy we were trying to do was to see you know, when a hurricane or when we detect a hurricane coming down the line, we are basically taking actions or protecting against a future event. And in security, there's a lot of times where you can see that coming. So, uh, you know, and the logic was, how can we justify investment on security events that are not happening yet, but we can see it coming on horizons, and we want to make sure that we're well prepared for it. And, uh, so and, an... and yeah. Sorry, Jess, right. go on. No, that, that, that's quite something. So, well, I... so there's, a, there's a weird, almost, yeah. it's like a conflict yeah. sort of coming through, which is risk and resilience. So there's this sense with risk that we can attempt to try and predict the future and then we can try and control it. Resilience is saying, what are you doing trying to predict the future? Let's make it so that we know it's gonna rain in the next six months. Let's make it so that it doesn't matter if it rains, you've got a roof. Um, and there is a certain amount of thinking in cybersecurity where we should be saying, I don't care if this happens next week in six months time, I don't care if it happens to that computer or this computer. What I need to be sure of is when it happens, I come out the other side stronger. Uh, and you see this in the, um, the engineering stuff out of Google, the SRE stuff, system reliability engineering. I think there's a real place for that in cyber. Uh, I think there are some things, and I noticed uh, Mario's here, he, he'll jump in with the, uh, the Kinevin view of the world. Um, but there are some things that are just issues. We know we've got a patch stuff, so just do it. There are some things which are complicated. Let's go and work out the risk and work out which bits we should do and which bits we shouldn't. And there's some stuff we can't predict. And maybe there we should just be thinking how we survive it and how we learn from it. Uh, but I'll let Mario jump in and tell me how wrong I am in my interpretation. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Come on, Mario. You're on the chat. Let's hear your voice. No, not at all. It, it wasn't uh, from that point of view. So the, the thing is, is understanding how, um, as Phil was saying, how complexity works, right? And, and the, problem with, um, the, the problem with statements uh, around how we can uh, potentially look at, um, uh, at the complex adaptive system, right? Um, the, the, the good analogy for cybersecurity is that depending on the experience of the person looking at the problem and depending on the, the, uh, the nature of how they will treat the problem, it's going to be completely different. Right. So one of the things that, um, uh, so myself and Phil are going to be doing the talk on Kinevan framework this Friday, um, and one of the, um, uh, the things that, I'm, um, that is also planned to be, to be talked about is exactly that, that uh, in cyber we've got a, the, the, what I call the tyranny of expertise, right? We tend to treat every problem as, as it's complex and that we as the experts, we know, we know better and we know what needs to happen in order to make the situation better, and that's not the case. But one of the key principles of managing in complexity is understanding that the experts are often wrong and we're not getting enough, uh, enough of a view of, um, uh, of other areas uh, of the organization, of other sciences, of other, of, of other things that will make our uh, organizations more resilient. Because the, the problem is one of, um, and I apologize, this may sound a bit of offensive, but I don't have a better English word to talk about it. Um, but um, it's a bit of the inbreeding of InfoSec. Right, that we talk with InfoSec with each other, right? We try to convince peers that we've got really smart solutions to our problems. Uh, when uh, if it was a problem with expertise, we would have solved it by now. Oh, Mario, I've got to come in on that because I, I wholeheartedly <laughs> agree with you. Um, you know, I, I describe it as we're talking to the church, but what about the heathens who aren't in the church? Uh, and yep. that's kind of actually how we are, to your point. You know, we talk to each other, as indeed we are now. But are there any business people on this call? Uh, I, I suspect I was, there are some people sorry, I was, I was, facing I was gonna, into business. Go on. I was going to I was going to make sorry. an observation because actually I'm not a security professional. I'm a testing professional, and I'm kind of hearing some real parallels with what goes into testing, where you've kind of got this thing of like you can't actually guarantee the final outcome for whatever you actually do. Um, 
<clears throat> and that's kind of one of the issues they have. Now, one of the things I find in testing is everybody thinks they can be, they're an expert in testing will kind of say, that's how you should be doing it. Whereas I suspect the problem for you guys is actually there's a lack of knowledge about what you do. Um, and then you kind of left to be those experts into doing, um, you know, to act in your sphere. And that was kind of, it was kind of just a very interesting, interesting uh, contrast that I kind of noted from, you know, from my own area. No, so that's a, that's an interesting one. I think part of our challenge, now I, I quite enjoy it, but I'm very much aware that I'm not an expert in all fields of security. Mm -hmm. So I describe myself as a generalist. I know a little bit about a lot, but I need testers to know their piece or application developers to know their piece. And then it's marshalling it to, to present it into the business. That's kind of why I'm looking into the Wardley maps to help me communicate that into the business who are even less cyber savvy than I am. Um, so that's, that's, that's my hope. So. I'm going to jump in at this point uh, just very quickly. Uh, there's two things. I just want to show uh, just some slides just to explain one particular issue with insurance. And, and then very much, um, oh, unfortunately, I, I have to disappear. I have to go and put my young, uh, young boy to bed. Um, I, if uh, taking this uh, conversation forward, I, I would recommend you all listen uh, again. And I, I, I'm sorry to put Sarah uh, Clark on the spot. I mean, Sarah, from my point of view, uh, was heading off in the right direction in terms of the use of mapping and how and sarah i'm sorry to put you on the spot but it'd be, it'd be really really good to hear more from you uh on that but before we do i just want to quickly warn warn you about the insurance side so um apologies for this um can you see a slide yes we can Sam. yeah perfect right um so uh taking it from the top uh, shareholders, um, uh, you know, the, the thing about maps is these are flows of capital. You've got shareholders, investment into an industry. The industry needs to profit, say, from a drug. Uh, actually, this is food and food standards, but that's okay. Uh, what you've got is consumers. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's drugs or food or whatever. The, you know, the consumers don't want this stuff to kill them or harm them in a really bad way. But that's actually really expensive to do those standards. So the drug companies and the food companies would get away with using insurance as much as possible, except for the fact that consumers are also voters. And that's why with government, we have regulators who create and enforce those standards. And if we didn't have government, if we didn't have regulators, believe me, we'd have insurance everywhere because it's the most economical model. And uh, some people would die because of uh, insurance covers it. So when you look at this space and you're looking at it from the point of view of regulators as well, the, the big problems uh, for regulators in food standards or drugs is, is not so much uh, the problems of pollution in terms of the raw material and then the management of those standards when it's within a free market free trade agreement. The area is all the real problems always come when it's outside of our control. It's, it's outside of the space, outside of the free market. And in those cases, there's real cost to this stuff, uh, which is why there's a big push you'll notice in government to to drive things towards more open standards. And we're doing that. Why, why are we pushing it out of the goodness of our heart? No, we also need to reduce the cost of the investigations because this stuff is expensive. But the, there's another problem we have is that in most industries don't actually know their global supply chain, which is really annoying. Uh, all they know is one up, one down. So they knew who they bought from, who they sold to, and that's it. That, that, that's a limited knowledge of their supply chain. And that also hampers investigations. So we do know the global supply chain is associated with waste. So there are games that we can play because we know shareholders and consumers don't like wastes. We can manipulate the space by having a ranking, which is randomly pick the CEOs of big companies and say, these are the most wasteful. Uh, because we know they don't have the data to demonstrate they aren't the most wasteful. And the last thing CEOs like being is, is the top of a list which says you're the most wasteful CEO because they're, well, they're all egotistical as well. So, so this is playing with people's you know, social capital as well. So the point that I wanted to raise is can you map this stuff? 
And can you map the sort of security implications of this stuff? Yes, I, I think you can. You've got to start by focusing on who the users are, including not only your consumers, but potentially your shareholders and also regulators as well. I would be very careful about the insurance idea, um, only because um, uh, in, in, you've got to consider the impact of harm of the individuals. I know a lot of people talk about insurance but the most important thing that i want to say to buy this pair off is sarah can you can you can you because you had some really good ideas and i i don't think we heard enough and i i'm, I'm really sorry to uh, have to disappear but sarah can we can we hear a bit more from you at that point i have to Thanks, disappear Simon. sorry thank Simon. you but thank you for <laughs> that i understand the well, uh, the parental task so and, and just maybe before you go simon thank you very much you've been a, a hero you've, you've done literally two days of this from 10 to 10. Oh, that's really, right really it's my pleasure you. now listen to sarah because sarah was really <laughs> hitting some good points all right sarah Gosh. over to you oh my goodness okay no pressure um I guess, um, and the, you know, it's always a treat to, to listen to Simon and everybody else here because there's such a depth of experience in the room. But the, the example that sprang to mind with me is for me with where mapping could help was in the context of something I've dealt with recently because I focus more on data protection now than security strategy, or they'll do a bit of both, a lot of both. But um, it was data mapping. It was using automated tools to identify data um, across a landscape um, a larger business and of course there are many component inputs to that and um, depending on the capabilities of the tool that you buy it may just be able to find some data which produces a long list of alerts that it may be sensitive and produces a very manual to-do list because nobody knows what the data is what it was for should it be there should it not be there most of the activity happens out with the tool and you just end up with a very clumsy non-standardized inventory without a lot of effort um, what are you actually trying to achieve with it? How long is it actually going to take before you get to anything that resembles perhaps an automated data loss prevention or alerting tool that may actually be proactively operationally valuable? And in that, the customers are business-wide. Um, you are going to be looking at data owners within the business. You're going to be looking at um, those who ultimately own the risk of data loss. Um, and you will be able to attach each component of your requirements for um, identifying data to produce a, a, a data inventory in the business. So I guess that's one of the examples where I feel that this could be really valuable because there is so much snake oil in this governance space for data. It's just it's it's a wash with masses of snake oil. And um, this kind of mapping and identifying who requires what and what it actually takes to get to a state of maturity where you can actually get the advertised value is exactly where I see Wardley mapping as a technique excelling. Hopefully that made sense. That was a little bit of a brain dump. That was a bit of a stream of consciousness I have. I actually have a decision flow diagram I made with lots of distressed looking emojis attached to it um, for precisely this challenge. Um, oh, which please share that could... if you could, Sarah. <laughs> Well, why don't I hand back over to the room because I'm sure there's there's going to be some strong opinions about some stuff I just said, and I'll find I'll find that just for a bit of a laugh. It's not precise, so, but I think it might illustrate what I'm talking about. No, please please uh, please go away and find that. Well, not go away. Please find that if you can. But I suspect you'll get some questions, and I suspect you might end up with more support than you you perhaps think. Uh, anybody want to chime in on any of Sarah's? Uh, did you call it stream of consciousness? Go on then, Phil. So I think so is right. I think using mapping when you've got a clear idea of what it is you're trying to achieve, so in, in that case, uh, data mapping, uh, is it is useful. I, I've used it in the past around security operations, and I had a very clear definition of what it was I was trying to achieve. Uh, and it allowed me to identify the components involved, the maturity of them, uh, the opportunities for in-source, outsource, and communicate them very easily to a bunch of technical guys who'd never really looked up from their screens, which was useful. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, Sarah's absolutely right there. Having a list of things that we know what the answer should be, we can map them all. And that's actually not that hard. 
Uh, and, and I agree with that. That's kind of where I I had my idea to narrow the conversation and the and the wider strategic piece that Simon wanted us to tackle. I, I've kind of developed the idea of don't bore the ocean, chunk it down, do the bits that you can do, and therefore over time narrow down the bits that you can't do to 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 make them more digestible, if you can put it that way. But I did see on the chat, uh, forgive me here, I'm going to ping, I think it was uh, Hayden, Hayden Brook. Hayden, you were talking about, uh, in fact, I think you used the term mission command, which I remember from my military days, but I have seen it in the industry to some extent around, you know, what's the, what's the corporate vision statement? What's the corporate mission? But I happen to know, and you're going to have to tread this line because you're, you're in that innovator with a uh, with a platform that you developed but perhaps I could draw you in as to where you saw that opportunity because I think it it harks back to what Phil was talking about in terms of the consultancies are struggling because they're going to find what they do automated and I think you have something uh, yeah can you hear me we can indeed uh, yeah, we can. Um, yeah, so we kind of went down the path of I used to be a, a consultant and now I'm a vendor. So two of the probably, probably the most hated profiles on the call. Um, um, and as a consultant, I worked in the supply chain space. <laughs> yeah, so, but we're uh, being transparent of, uh, here, so don't worry. Great, great. Um, and I used to, yeah, a lot of uh, Excel work, basically looking at assurance over suppliers. And that essentially was uh, similar to the mapping done here. It's you just mapping out supply chains and who relies on who, both in terms of data shared, but also in terms of like availability of service. Um, and I've like found interestingly that automating that you can automate it up to a certain point, but it's quite hard to automate the decision making around approving a supplier at a certain control level that you think the business kind of would be okay with. Um, and a lot of our clients uh, are still struggling with the fact that the security teams don't really get an articulated message from the board in terms of how to peg that risk statement. And so that was one interesting thing kind of we found in automating that and that you can't ever really get rid of the human. Uh, and then the second interesting thing we found is that it, kind of our solution works almost like a social network. So we end up mapping out supply chains quite nicely in that you can connect with both your clients and your suppliers through the platform. Uh, and in doing so, we've kind of seen this, um, this push of security policy down the supply chain. And that's quite interesting seeing that suppliers seem to respond best uh, and really some quite large suppliers as well when they're dictated to by other uh, entities, which are typically their clients paying them money. Uh, which then brought me back around to thinking about the mission statement. A lot of mission statement for suppliers, the ultimate mission is very much, um, so the VC actually that I was talking about uh, used the, the mission to the moon that the US launched in the 60s kind of as an example. And they said that the, that was the best mission, mission statement ever because essentially it was, we're going to place a man on the moon within the next 10 years. And no matter who worked in NASA, that was what they were there to do. And in a way, then that helped shape the conversation around where to invest the money because if something didn't meet that mission statement, then essentially it was just deprioritized immediately. So it's quite a crude way, but quite an effective way of then um, almost using that to, I suppose, map out the, and prioritize the needs of the business. No, I, I, I can get that. I think one of the things that struck me was that area of supply chain risk. So I think it was Simon's point where most outfits only know one up and one down. Um, but I suspect I'm not the only one who realizes that actually, even though I'm a competitor to the other outfits in my space, we actually have some commonality in our supply chain, whether it is the vendor, we're all using one cloud or another, whether it's a three letter acronym cloud, and that's not necessarily beginning with A, by the way, um, there are others, but you know, there's some commonality in there in the, in the mechanism that we use to deliver or produce whatever it is where our business is doing but we have our own defined set of questions that we think are appropriate and we don't take anybody else's word for it we have to go and kick the tires ourselves i've seen that an awful lot of times and i've been i've actually been guilty of asking the questions as well as being on the receiving end um, as of I. both sides so yeah that's kind of an interesting challenge but i think where i'm struggling with that is the wardley map piece for that i yeah i'd have to, i think i need to stop and think about that um but i think uh so, hey, ironically, your point I've about the, the, sorry, <laughs> so, I, wardley map for supply chain 
<laughs> have you indeed? Do, yeah, I, unfortunately, you... it's not in a place where I can share it right now. Okay. Um, no. But the... It's about it, to it, ask for it, Phil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm happy to. Um, there are multiple stakeholders. Uh, and the interesting thing is your suppliers, you, your customers, your regulators, and everyone are all, much like in everything in security, are all stakeholders here and all have slightly different needs. So, you know, I, I as the CISO, want to have good, reliable information. My um, internal manager who is requesting a new service, he wants it done quick. <laughs> um, my supplier wants it done quick, but doesn't want it to be too invasive and wants it to be something they can, they can do in a, a very easy pre-sales process. My regulator wants me to have covered everyone. Um, you know, there's a lot of different needs out there that you need to think about when you're looking at supply chain. But interestingly, it, it, it does, there are some real opportunities. And one of the, Hayden and I have spoken a few times. And, and one of the reasons is I can see that what he's doing is actually moving uh, a component in, in that space uh, to a more mature place. So, so one of the maps, I'd the agree with that, Phil. So, go on, Denny. So one of the maps I created once where I thought was really, really powerful was, you know, you know the evolutionary, um, basically the four stage of evolution. In, visualize this map where the four stages go about, we are tracking the maturity of particular products that we, we support from a security team or particular vendors that we support. And the level one is information. We have information about it. The second one is we have data. The third one is we can consume it. The fourth one, we can react to events. So you can see that you go in these stages where, you know, and the simple question is, there's a breach, there's a problem in product X. Do we even know who to talk to, right? Do we even know who the hell owns that? Do we even know who has access to it? Where's the vendor contact, all that stuff, right? The second stage is, great. Do we even know what data is available? Do we even know what we can get from that platform? The fourth stage is, can we consume it? Can we visualize, sorry, the third stage, can we consume it? Can we visualize it? Can we actually do something about it? And the fourth one is, can we actually react to events? Actually, do we have the data in our system? Can we start to be proactive in how it goes? Now you take your supplies, your, your products, you, you can map them from a point of view of this product is depending on that one, depends on this one, depends on that one. And then you put them on that scale and you end up literally with a pile of stuff on the left and, you, and the pile of stuff that is distributed most likely is you have more material or you have events on it. And you can actually almost map your strategy based on that. Because you can go to the business and say, look, the next three months or six months or a year, we can move X to the right because we're going to do some work on it. But all these um, other products that we have, we, we barely can touch it because, you know, we don't have enough uh, resources to tackle them. And the bit that I didn't do, which for me was the killer one, is I want to go to every single business owner and tell them the status of the products that they were responsible for, that they have bought, that we from a security point of view would have told them that we're not able to protect them. I, we can react to it, but we, today we're not being proactive on it. But that map is very powerful because it shows you the stages of it. And, and for example, like from, a, from a, even the risk, you know, the risk mapping or the third party due diligence, which ones of those do you even understand what's on the other side? Do you understand the data that I provide to you? And, and then you're able to react to it or you're able to proactively do something about their security. Is that, uh, there, is um, <laughs> Sorry? That, that last bit, then the question around kind of reacting, what, what do you mean by that in terms of you're waiting on that you like, what's, what's the output of the Wardley map in terms of the reaction to the supplier? So I'll give an example, right? The, in this particular case, the first time that we have a G Suite incident, right? We had to mm -hmm. track some dude that was actually flying at the time where the thing was happening. And we have to wait for him to land for us to have access to even understand what data we had inside G Suite uh, on, on that particular type of incident. And, 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 and the way I look at incidents, and, and you probably heard me say before, is I treat incidents as opportunity. And actually going back to that comment a bit earlier, I use incidents as a source of data to give me probability. It's not perfect, but it's the best I've got. But in this case, by the time we finished, literally three incidents later and after a, a bit of investment, we had uh, actually not quite that real time because Google doesn't give you real time data on their logins, but we had up to a couple of hours um, delayed data and we were able to react and we were able to trigger events based on what was happening in our G Suite activity. 
So we're able to detect files that were shared that are not supposed to be shared, accesses that maybe shouldn't be happening, you know, uh, logins that were not supposed to be happening, weird activities, impossible logins, or at least from a, somebody from a office point of view, all those things we could now react to proactively. And a lot of them were benign stuff, but you know, some of them you know, were actually problems. But in the past, we were blind. And then we have other incidents where we had problems where we couldn't even restore the thing, right? We had business losses, considerable business losses, because data had been deleted, backups had not been kept, due diligence had not been done, and it was a system that you know nobody was paying attention because some department had bought it, they used their own cards, you know, it was kind of over there. We kind of knew that it was on the backlog of things we had to eventually get to, but we didn't have a good way to visualize that. So it was on, it was not even on the info, it was like below, it was level zero, right? We barely yeah. even knew what was there. Got you. But that, that, I found that that map was really powerful, right? Because it really allowed us to even show our next three to six months uh, plan. And actually, I end up going to teams saying, look, what we have is a first class instance response team. So the, the bad news is we, we can't do anything about your system for the next six months. The good news is if you're hit, at least you got a great team to support you. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, what I want to do, which I didn't get around to is to say, hey, if you want to fund some investment on here, then, you know, you can cover that cost. But we are only funded to cover 30 or 40 next year out of the 500 mission critical apps that the business has. I think I can place that conversation, Denis. Sarah, you, you came up on chat to say you'd, you'd found your, um, I don't want to call it Slide, Google. yeah. I mean, Slide. <laughs> yeah, I did. I'll, 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 um, I'll share that, share that now. Um, I'll just make it bigger. Um, can you see that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> We can indeed. Do you want to talk us through it? It's not. It's not the perfect data flow. It was. It was the edge. We all have to draw a picture when you've been banging your head against the table trying to describe what the challenge might be about going out and spending on some tech that people are expecting to solve your end-to-end -end problem for you. Um, so this is where a Wardley map could have probably stepped in. So most of the solutions, um, when it talks about doing automated data discovery, um, are more or less rudimentary, rudimentary when they're vanilla out of the box. They need to be trained. They are more or less clever with AI. They can do more or less actual control of data flows and putting stuff into labeling stuff for, for later categorization or actually blocking it once you're sure what your rules need to be. But every single green box and every single blue box involves a person initially to validate that, to actually put it in a fit state to be rolled out into your environment. Um, there was an awful big push at the start of thinking about a, a GDPR program or just generally ramping up data protection to where it should have been ever since the Data Protection Act came in. Um, and um, people were ignoring the fact that this was going to produce a long to-do list that really we were looking down the pipe of maybe 24 to 36 months before you were getting the kind of automated support to manage what was largely residual risk out of these solutions that everybody was selling. And that you need to have a pretty good understanding of your data estate and have your stakeholders engaged and, and help them understand their own data before something like this will work. Uh, and, and mapping those components of knowledge and skills and technology using a map to how more or less mature they are in the business and how available they are. Um, was what I was doing really through my, my own pictures and um, spreadsheets etc that a map would have been really handy for um, I mean one of the things I did I actually had another another slide here that um, this was this was the result of a lot of pain and angst this was trying to demonstrate to a very large business it was actually in this case an insurer some kind of simplistic way of showing them that you need to both look at the um, data, but you primarily need to look at the purposes that data is serving. This is another element where mapping could be incredibly useful um, because you, people were always starting with systems. They were going out and taking a list out of their CMDB and saying, is there data in that particular system? And it was completely divorced from the use of that data and from the data subject from whom you needed to have a notice 
um, and a purpose described and um, all of the other lawful bases thrashed out. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's something I'm, I'm happy to share this stuff around if it's of, of interest. It was just one way of trying to visualize stuff in a, in a consumable manner, which is, I guess is what mapping's all about. So I'm well, very interested in third party stuff too. <laughs> no, there's so, there's so much that we need to tackle, but I'd, Sarah, I think I'd, I'd be interested to see where you take this with the, if you do start to play with the Wardley map or mapping. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, like you, you said, it's a seven back. year process. Yeah, six <laughs> years of thinking about it and the last year of doing some. I'm kind of year six, I think. No, and that eureka moment will come, I'm sure. Uh, no, thank you for sharing that. Um, it, I find the pictures paint a thousand words. Sorry, it's a it's a truism, but it, it works. That's kind of why I'm drawn to the Wardley mapping piece. Sarah, could you show the first slide again? Sure. Uh, let me just share again. And yeah, make it bigger again. Is that up? Brilliant. Um, so it occurs to me that if you reword, are you sure it's personal with do you do you have an do you know it's personal or do you know why it's there? Do you have a capability to know why it's there? Each one of those is a component in the value chain of identifying personal data. Yes. And I think you've got all the components and the value chain here set up. It might just need a little bit of rewording. And then all it is, is really then a case of identifying the maturity of it. So is this something we think we want to do? Is this something we do, but we'd make it up every time? I've got a tool, but it's not very good. Or, you know, I've got a service that I pay for. You usual sort of thing you do in Wardley Maps. I think you're sort of more than halfway there towards having a Wardley Map. And it would be fascinating then to when you apply a tool to see how it changes. It would. And I mean, this is this is one of the reasons I'm on this call, because as soon as I, as soon as I started to really get a handle on what Simon was talking about, I could see that it's what I had been trying to drag myself towards in in, you know, in clumsy, <laughs> clumsy use of um, slides and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, thanks, Phil. That that's exactly it. That's what I felt I saw. Sarah, I'll be more than happy to help if, if you want, right, to collaborate, because I think you, you want to something here, right? And, um, and, and I, I think, you know, the, the, the th what you have here is also you can, you can use a map to really visualize uh, the, almost this maturity of, uh, of the data that you're collecting. And, yeah. uh, and then, you know, and show a good example of, you know, the risk, you know, where that the business exists, you know, or has by, for example, not, not an, the, the, way, the way I always tend to look, ask the question is, you don't want to be discovering this doing a breach, right? You know, yes. This, this kind of question oh, are exactly yes. the questions that you have to ask, right? Doing a breach, you know, what, how much painful it is before is nothing compared when you, you have to provide an answer to execs in a couple of hours of exactly what was exposed, exactly what's the risk of the business and what's going on, right? So, yeah, um, yeah no, let's continue. Thank this would be great. Yeah. Yeah, well, private. If you um, private message me your contact details, I'll, I'll take you up on that as well. So I'll, I'll connect you to Denis if you're not already. But Denis, I'm conscious you you've got a lot on your plate. I wonder whether I could co-opt you to um, perhaps task Petra to work with Sarah, given uh, Petra seems to have an affinity for this stuff. Absolutely, put her there. Is she on a call? Can I ask though? I, did, um, I didn't how, see how that. Can yeah, I ask yeah, the, what, what is yeah. the security value we're mapping here? So I'd be working it backwards. So sorry, uh, that's how I would approach it in terms of, for me, it would be the where are we in the, the compliance or the exposure to GDPR breach? That's kind of how I'd be working it back, the conversation with the business. But Sarah, do you have a thought there? Yeah, I mean, in the context of this, it's most about understanding your risk profile and your risk exposure. Where where do you squarely centre the main expenditure of effort and kit um, is going to be an, an awful lot 
about the kind and quantity and sensitivity of data. And also there's the element of third party involvement in there, how arm's length is the management of that data. Um, so th the security value add is also at the other end in terms of instant notification and um, investigation and breach response um, in that you're going to be able to quickly identify what's actually been exposed or is at risk to inform that exercise as well. So what would be the capital flowing between the components? Is that just the cost of mitigation? Is that the, the fines involved? The capital flowing between components. I'm not sure I know what you mean. Apologies. So that's that's a, the that's one of those things that Simon uses to track between the, the different blocks. So I, I hesitate to say it, but I think it's all of those things. I think it's definitely there's a fines piece in there. There has to be a cost of the controls to limit that exposure. But one of the areas where I think we're weak is we don't actually cost the process time. Um, so the capital, well, could, capital could also be uh, reputational damage and other aspects, not just yeah. uh, monetary. There's direct and indirect for financial, there's reputational, there's also the harm to, to data subjects. There's actually harm to individuals, um, uh, which is central to the GDPR, which we tend to give off our risk matrices. Mm -hmm. Come on, I, Phil. I feel like there's something I, missing I in, the, in the context uh, of, of Phil, but I think Phil <laughs> wants to jump on that. Sorry, as I say, if we were looking at that decision flow, it's quite a tactical look at a capability. So it's a capability of, of knowing where personal data is in the organization. Now, from a security benefit point of view, that's a chunk of my information assets. If I know what I've got, I can protect it. That's my security benefit. In terms of capital, um, I think the capital is actually the increase in knowledge about personal data, I would imagine. What we're building up in terms of value for the stakeholder is we know what we've got, we know where it is, we can move faster. It, it, I may be misreading, but that, that's how it sends. No, but you can also, you're right, Phil. Yeah, because you can also monetize and make better and more efficient use of that data from, from a business point of view as well. It's not solely a protective gain. There's also, uh, also a the, utility gain. Correct, the deduplication and, opportunity is significant. Can we not consider risk as a substantial negative value on its own. So the fact that you have data, forget it's vulnerable or not, the fact that you are holding this big pile of you know sensitive data that flows up a whole bunch of risk. And again, you know what we're mapping here, the value chain is about visibility. It's not how much is this worth, but it's how visible it is, how, how much it affects the user needs directly. So yeah. in, in this context, you have risk inherent could risk. contain a whole bunch, sorry? Sorry, I, I interrupted. Apologies. You have inherent you have inherent risk, and you understand the scale of your inherent risk through this as well. If I'm not understanding, yeah. and, and I feel like there's a few different kinds of risk involved here, and and that's okay because right now, you know, I, I want I want to treat risk as its own store of value, right? Or its, its own store of capital, um, which contains a whole bunch of stuff. It could be fines, it could be damage, it could be uh, you know a reputational loss uh, uh, or loss of sales but there is risk flowing between the components. And the other side, we have, and you know, Alan was saying before, you know, all the consultants are, are going out of business because you know, they're being automated. I think it's more that they don't know what value they're providing to the business. So if we look at how to actually model that uh, value of security, right? And there's something that has come up a few times before uh, that we don't know what the value we're providing. So on the one hand, we're trying to mitigate risk. On the other hand, we are providing additional value. Um, for example, take a look at Zoom. You know, they're upselling customers to get encryption, right? So there is additional positive value there in addition to the risk. I'd agree with that, Avi. I think to your, to your point about the, the risk potential around the data, uh, Sarah, jump in and, and correct me if I get this wrong, but one of the principles now enshrined in the legislation is that you should only have the data for which you've got a lawful purpose. And that's yes. actually starting to shift business from, I'm going to keep the data because I never know when I might need it, to actually, do I need it? And, and if I don't need it, I'm going to get rid of it. And it's a, I've seen the pendulum start to shift. I wouldn't say it's completely shifted where we're almost getting to the point where they're not storing enough data. I mean, we certainly, I've certainly seen in the security space, we struggle with the 
well, have I got the logging data for that device or for that service? Because I need to look back as to when the attack started. And if it's more than 30 days and I haven't ticked the box in the particular bucket, uh, I haven't got that log data. So that challenge is definitely in there about how we maximize the value from the data we've got, that we minimize the data that we're storing and the benefits to the business, particularly in storage, no matter how cheap it is. But I think the idea of there is a risk exposure if you've got more data, I can see how we could play that. But, I, but I'm just conscious that the volume of data isn't necessarily where the risk sits. It's about um, what is that data, Phil? Jay. I think it's about visibility of that risk. So, so risk is uh, one of the reasons I joined this is I've not yet worked out how to represent a flow of risk in a Wardley map. Um, yep, Wardley maps uh, show a flow of value generally they, they uh, capital or, or the like but but ultimately there's somebody at the top who is receiving value from a chain of components risk and value do not always follow the same path they don't necessarily for the same component or the same action always go back to the same stakeholder mm -hmm. um and they they so so I, I think there's a really interesting piece of work to understand risk and how you would characterize it in a Wardley map. And I, I've not done it yet. I, I've, I've thought about it a few times. I've still not got there. And I think that needs to happen. In terms of data, um, I am increasingly of the opinion that data is a toxic material. And when you've got a toxic material and you use it to do things that make money, you store it and you're careful and you use it. And you know that's what you do. That's how your business operates. And then when you can't use it to make money anymore, you, you know, go and find a quiet little burial ground somewhere and you dump it. Um, I, I, work, I, I spent some time talking to a security consultancy, funnily enough, who had a database full of zero days that their researchers had found over the last 20 years that the vendors had never patched. They told the vendors, the vendors had ignored them. Now, they had a database of zero days. They couldn't do anything about it so there was no value to them they couldn't publish any well they weren't an organization that was going to publish advisories um if it ever spilled it would be a dramatically bad day for their pr um and the best analogy i could think of is you've got a barrel of toxic waste you know you can't make money out of it and it, if it ever goes wrong you're screwed and i think more and more data is a bit like that that we, we will collect lots of data, it will give us value up until the point it doesn't, and then when it spills, it hurts us. And I think it's a toxic material. Sometimes that's a valuable thing, and sometimes it's not. I think it's, it's an interesting analogy. I think this data was just an example, by the way. It was, it's not just data. There's a lot of other things that could introduce risk. For example, let's oh, say absolutely. you set up you know, one of the components of your application. You need to set up a spring, yeah, a spring on your server. That introduces a lot of inherent risk. But then if you add on an activity of proper patching and updates, then that has a reverse flow of, I guess, reducing risk or, or increasing security relative to that component. And, and that, of course, flows all the way up to the users. And it might not be the risk that they care about, but there is additional value flowing through those components. And one part of risk is, uh, I don't remember who said it earlier, a big part of risk is damage to to your income or damage to your to your assets potentially so so first of all i actually think the the toxic and and, and using data as potential toxic is so, so very spot on so sarah i had a question for you on your map on your analysis when you discover the data do you take into account where the data is and actually you can even use the toxic analysis do you take into account that that data happens to be in a nice protected environment with all sorts of guarantees or you actually take into account that the data is just literally sitting around the corner in a place that you know is highly unprotected a good example is is it a data managed by an sre team in a lockdown environment very small amount of individuals have access to that data or is it on an s3 bucket that half the company has access to and you have you are one aws key leak away from that data being exposed because the risk yes, is very so different 
Yeah, this is what this is what your record of processing activity is about. It's about noting down. Um, you always start with a purpose. You know, what which data set are we talking about? Usually looking at where it originates from. So have we got a lawful basis for collecting it in the first place? Where are we putting it? Are there third parties involved in looking after it or are they actually hosting it? Who is using it and what are they using it for? Who's using it for a secondary use and what is that? Uh, how much of the data, how sensitive it is. All that adds up to an inherent risk view. Then you look at the controls in place as an assessment when it's when you establish that the inherent risk is high enough to warrant really kicking the tires that hard. So absolutely, yes, those surrounding factors are taken into account. But that is, you know, the same as any other risk management flow there should be. You should have some easy triage criteria for where you really kick the tires that can be asked at the earliest bright ideas stages of something. If it's your pre-existing estate when you're trying to go back around the horn and, and look at everything that you've not looked at properly before um i've i've kind of designed a sort of quick and simple 15 minute questionnaire that gets you to your highest inherent risks and rules out the stuff where you don't need to kick the tires quite as quickly or quite as hard so you can actually expend the kind of effort you're talking about to really drill down to, well, you know, really, if it's locked up like Fort Knox and it's all on prem, why are we getting so fretful about it? Let's look at the stuff where we've we've outsourced it to the guy in his bedroom and it's yeah. the personal data. I'm, I'm so sat here wondering whether we should apply that to the track and trace app whether that's the UK version or anybody else's. So, Alan, were, were you part, did you follow the, 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 um, the sessions we had on COVID on the Safe Paths app? Because we actually did the threat model and we did a very cool analysis on actually where they, uh, they applied encryption and where they store data. And one of the things that we discovered was that they had a couple of pockets of highly sensitive data that they could dramatically improve their design if they changed a bit and, and the, some of the workflows that they have. And by the way, Sarah, you, you can map that maturity. You can create a map that on the left is highly toxic, right? Uh, very sensitive data. And on the right is actually nice, benign, protected data. Yeah, so there's data and it's kind of um, pretend it's unknown unknowns and then work your way down to something that's known and managed. Yeah, so your analogy is, you know, I, I you know, I, I would argue that data that, for example, doesn't have a lot of, you know, security, you know, confidential data or or, or very, you know, problematic, but, and data that is highly protected in your Fort Knox analogy, from a risk point of view, they are almost equivalent, right? Where data that might be mid-sized, you know, on a toxicity level, maybe is not, you know, is not as insane, but if that's unprotected, that is actually very dangerous. So, so you could, yeah. you could I mean, I've got a risk flow diagram that you would, that I think you'd be really interested in. <laughs> yeah, I agree completely. And you can map that, right? And you can, and you, you can actually map even the, the value of the relationships or, or even ownership levels, because sometimes what you find is dramatic blind spots. It's, it's like that map that Simon had of, you know, the a particular groups think that it's okay, but then as soon as he comes out of their domain or the, the, the supply chain of that data, is, is you know or insane, right? So if you look at, T Tony actually created me, and Tony created a really cool diagram for GDPR where we, we were tracking the, the multiple stages. But if you look at how data flows to an organization, and we sometimes do this in thread models, you see that there's lots of technologies and players that have access to that data. And some of them do a great job, but some of them don't. And your oh, biggest God, risk yes. might come from those who are not doing a good job at protecting that data but the data will still flow through them or they have access to that data. And you can match that. Said, who, who said the marketing team then? Did I hear that? Marketing and HR. Oh, Allegedly. A bit naughty of me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. So, so, some, sometimes technology are the worst ones. Sometimes security is the worst ones. I, I, oh, I, I've, I've done, I've done yes. analysis where my, my conclusion was that the security... Uh, advantage of this product is negative. We actually have more risk buying this product than the risk that we, we do. So, so we buy more risk with putting this product in our system than the risk that it reduces. So we actually have negative risk value from putting that product in our, in our, in our system. That's good. To, that's good to know. I've suspected that a number of times, but um, 
<laughs> um, I won't press you to share that. So, Dennis, how did you model that flow of risk? So, so it's it's about so for for example, like in this, in you need to think of almost this in in several dimensions, right? Because remember, the, a map is um, is visual, right? So, it's, a simple example, right, is take um, a normal flow of an application, right? So, imagine a free tier application where you have a website who talks to an API, who talks to a backend, who talks to a database, right? Maybe just you know four or five layers, right? And, and now if I ask you to rate that based on how fast can you patch, right? So simple question, shit hits the fan, right? How fast can you patch it? Can you patch it? In, and, and on the right-hand side, on the commoditized version is two hours. The next, the product version is a day. Then is a week, and on the on the on the genesis layer is you can't, right? So if even if you just did that, you immediately know where you have lots of problems if you had a vulnerability in that system. And and I have cases where we couldn't patch it, right? We don't have the source code. Last time they tried it, they blew up the whole system. Other times that you, it takes a week to push to production, even if the CEO is on everybody's back. So suddenly you go and say, okay, so you know. I can now see where I have gaps, right? And the thing that is very interesting, especially if you do more complex systems or, or you map a number of them, you realize that a lot of the times your security activities centered around the teams that actually patch very quickly because they tend to be the, or patch, I push security fixes very quickly because you know they react fast, they really embrace, they're those modern teams, I think Phil mentioned a bit in the past. But the problem is that they're not your risk because if you then ask the second question, which is within that time window of patchiness, right? Then you can ask the second question is, how long does it take you to detect the breach? And the, and the other more important is in that Delta that you are exposed, how much damage can be made, right? And sometimes what you find is that although some systems can be hit quite a lot, the amount of damage that you can do in two hours, the amount of damage that you can do in a day is limited where you might have other systems that, although it might take you, you know, one, two, three days, whatever, a, a number of period to cause damage, because you can't patch, because you can't fix, because you can't do a lot of stuff, because you can't reduce the, you know, reduce the impact, the, the risk of those things is massive. So if you, you can put that on a map and then immediately you start color coding where you spend your investment money, where you spend your, your fixed money or your security budget, and you might realize that you're putting money in completely the wrong places. You might find yeah, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a bell right? curve overlaid gotcha. over, a, over a Wardley map where you at the start you're going to have when it's Genesis, you could have high exploitability because it's so novel, but so few people know about it and the exploits aren't there and the expertise to put the exploits together isn't there. So e even though you can't secure it very well, your actual external risk, it's a bit like the C um, CVSS ratings, mm -hmm. um, yes. temporal, environmental and yay. Um, and then it goes up as something uh, approaches product level where you've got, it's better known, more people want to exploit it and that it's still easier to exploit because it's not actually commoditized in terms of capability to secure it and means of security, securing it and the people with skills to secure it. Just busking on what you said, because that's what it made me think of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, don't, look, I think we'd agree with that, but if, if I may, I think, um, that's where I've certainly found myself thinking more about business impact analysis than I have about security risk analysis, because I've used the BIA that comes out of business continuity thinking to drive me towards that. Well, is this critical system patchable to Denise's point? If it is, then actually that's not where I need to concentrate my attention, because I know I can do something about that. It's those areas where I can't patch correctly enough where even if I improve my mean time to detect my mean time to respond and recover is actually too long it's outside of that acceptable outage time whatever we're using to describe the business risk appetite I suppose but I, 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 I've definitely seen that um, horizontal axis using the time piece to drive activity but I'm kind of at that point thinking swim lanes and critical points of failure, which is not quite what a Wardley map is. 
but that's what I've you used in the past. Off. Has anybody uh, taken uh, that thinking further? You're not that far off. You know, a stream lane, right? You know, like if you if you connect the dots, right, and you have four stream lanes, right? <laughs> you got, and as long as it goes from left to right, in a you know, say in a logical way, you know, that's a map, right? Yeah, or indeed right to left because you're working in that Sorry, part left of the way, world. Yeah. Yeah, Sorry, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but now these days, if somebody shows me a, a world a map or a map like that where you actually go from right to left, it breaks my head. <laughs> hey, so no, just, no, look, we'll stick with the convention. We'll go left yeah. to right. Just, just be aware that in some parts of the world, they work the other way. I know. <laughs> so the interesting Sorry. thing is with a worldy map, you often are mapping a single um, x-axis. So you've got your depth of value chain, your visibility, and then you've got your single axis, which is your maturity. But we've got, we've got how good something is inherently. We've got how good we are at running it or itself. We've got how good we are at responding to it when it goes wrong. Uh, and talking to Sarah's point, we've also got how likely is it that somebody's going to have a pop at it? You know, is it so new they don't know about it, so old nobody remembers it, or somewhere in between where it gets a lot of attacks? The, the interesting challenge with the Wardy Map approach for security is if we try to isolate one of those, it, we struggle because we, you know, if you look at how well we could run something, that's one thing. But if we put that in isolation compared to how likely it is to be attacked, that doesn't quite work. And, and I think there's an interesting piece of work to put multiple views on a single map somehow. Then you wind up trying to have some kind of intuitive result there, which is not necessarily a bad mm. thing. That's just very far from, I feel like this discussion started more towards things like FAIR, right? Qualitative analysis. And now we're saying, well, it's more of a relative uh, approximation which might actually be more useful in some contexts. And, and I don't see I'm, the I, quality I, I of value. Have... Go on, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm struggling to see that we could get close to quality, uh, quantitative in any way that would be useful with Wardley mapping, apart from in a relative scaling sense. Um, I see the value in placing things in space and time and in terms of severity relative to each other to make decisions more so than putting costs in front of a board. We can, we can show it to them as the opportunity versus the cost of proposed mitigation, but I don't see that we can do costed alternatives with this. I could be missing something though. No, well, I, I think that might be where the value flow comes into it. And I, and I think, the fact that Phil is struggling with a risk flow because it doesn't quite follow the money in that sense. Um, but Phil, I was, I was going to come back to you on that in terms of the risk owner might be different to the system owner and certainly might be distance to the, different to the person who gains the profit from it. But that's actually why I, use, I find myself using the business impact analysis because I find that that helps me to identify who is the risk owner because it, it tends to link to who benefits from it. And that person that benefits is that should actually be the risk owner, but you, you, you so may have already the, dismissed that. Not, not necessarily benefits though, because risk is actually, a, you know, unbenefit. Well, if I may, um, Abby, I think that's one of the things that we in the security need to be aware of. We think of risk as a bad thing, but the business and entrepreneurs take risk because that's how they move quicker than their opposition. So we need to, we, we need to think about our risk averse nature, and I'm generalizing, uh, is not necessarily a good thing. And, and if we've got a secure business, you could actually take more risk. Absolutely Sorry, agree. You wanted to that you bring back, back to the value that you're mapping in the, in the yes. value chain in the first place. Sorry, Phil, I cut yes, you off. Absolutely. Uh, sorry, I, so when I think about security risk, I think about risk. And I know that's a that sounds like a banal statement, but um, security risk has set up these weird little buckets. So the idea that a business impact assessment is something you don't do in security risk is about these weird little discipline buckets we've established in security. If you go to any other risk discipline and say the consequence part of our risk 
calculation. Yeah, we don't do that. Those guys over there do that. We do the risk bit, the probability of it happening. And they would look at you like, the what? What? What are you talking about? Um, so, you know, a risk, and, and I'm going to promote my, my uh, later in the week session on the Open Information Security Risk Universe, other presentations available. Um, but um, a risk is fundamentally an event that occurs and one or more consequences as a result of that event. You can add things to that definition, like where does it come from, the source of it, what are the factors that drive it that make it more or less likely, or the factors that make it more or less consequential. But at its core, something happens and harm is caused. That is a risk. Um, knowing that there are more vulnerabilities in a particular technical component in a value chain tells me from a risk factor point of view that the the event that could be caused by that component in the value chain being compromised has become more likely um, so that's interesting but that then involves understanding my risk factors and the relationship of all those components to the risks i'm managing which i'll be honest almost nobody has not because it's yeah. not a good idea, but because for some reason we just don't do that, and I don't know why. Um, anyway, I agree with that, Phil. All right, thank you, Phil. Forgive me, I've just been reminded of the time. This session was due to, to wrap up at ten o'clock, which is two minutes away by my clock. Uh, oh, you I, got I, to I continue. Say, Phil, that you... that <laughs> was almost sounding like a conclusion. You, you can we, continue if you want. Continue. What's this? What, What's the game here, Denis? We, it's a, until you guys we're, we're drop. Running on. <laughs> okay. There's no limit. If, if we're going to run gym. on past ten o'clock, then that's good. We fill the gym. I wish I'd got to my gym. I'm afraid I've just finished eating my late supper. But that's my fault. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm just going to suggest um, one of the thing. One of the things I would suggest as a follow-on action, because I know we have to collect those at the end of the session, um, is maybe we should set up a session to generate a, a Wardley map model from Sarah's decision flow diagram. Yep. Let's take it as the basis and let's work to build out a, a, a full Wardley map to show the value of, of what that might be and how that could then be used to judge vendors and products and the like. Yeah, I've, I've certainly got that and we're going to link uh, Sarah mm -hmm. up with Denise and I think Denise Petra, perhaps, but uh, yes. your resource, you'll allocate. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I highly recommend you guys to check out the, the universe, the risk universe thing that uh, uh, Phil is talking about. It's really, really good. And it's open source. It's a great model. I think we should all get behind it. Phil, I, think I think I'm booked that's into that on one. Thursday, isn't it? Is that on Thursday? If I'm sorry, I'm reaching for my diary to confirm because it's in my diary. I've got so Friday, seconds. and I know because I'm missing it. But I think Sarah, let's do that because I think that's a, that's a really good um, session, right? You know uh, that we, we can do, and it's, it's a good example. It's practical. So, are, are you on us on the Slack of the summit? No, no. I'm yeah, not. if you could, you know, if you could join in, that'd be great because we, you know, I think most of us are there, and we can already start talking about that. Okay. And okay. Um, and the link is on the, the homepage. If you go to the summit site, the, the link on the top right, I think, of to Slack will send you to the invite. Brilliant. Okay, um, we'll do that. I think I have the WhatsApp addresses for both of you, so I'll connect you via WhatsApp as well, independent of Slack. I'm I'm on I'm not on WhatsApp, but you can try. <laughs> was it was it signal in that case, Sarah? Forgive me. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Denise, are you on signal? Yeah, I am. Okay, I'll tell you signal to connect you in that case. Uh, no, thank you for that. Um, cool. But I think that's certainly one output that I'd be fascinated to see. Um, Phil, rather than passing the baton completely to Sarah, I would like to put you on the spot a little bit because I think by the sounds of it, your risk and value flow piece is, is I think, something we'd all benefit from. And I'm more than a little intrigued that you've not been able to solve it yet, it, um, which I suspect is actually a combination of time as much as anything. Um, would you appreciate some help? Is that something we could throw some horsepower at? Yeah, yeah. No, we could, we could, um, we could get together and discuss. I, I think it takes a whiteboard because I think 
where I've run into problems, and I think Mario's uh, said the similar thing in the um, in the chat, where I've run into problems is not that that seems like a good idea, but actually when you start trying to draw it, it's it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think we, we actually need to draw it to, to show that we can do something that works. No, I, I, I I'd agree with that. Go, go on. Go. Phil, can I, can I ask if the, the reason that you're still struggling with it is it because you're trying to do just, you know, a simple model that is appropriate for all contexts in context of security. But by, by that, I mean, okay, so uh, uh, Sarah was talking about modeling, uh, sorry, mapping a, spe a specific process flow, right? Uh, whereas earlier, Dennis was talking about using mapping for a threat model or a threat mapping, which would be completely different. I'm thinking about in the context of mapping out an AppSec program, right? And each one of these things, I think uh, we need to model differently. You know, risk flow and what the components mean and what we're putting in mm -hmm. here is different. And, and I think this is what I'm clicking now. I've been tr struggling with it as well because I'm trying to find one thing that makes sense for all security and all risk in, in you know, technical security. And I don't think that works. I, I don't think there will be. Sec security is a weird emergent property of, of a collection of activities. But um, I'm, I'm fairly and uh, a fundamentalist is the wrong way of describing it but i'm quite um keen that risk is defined as risk as used by everyone else who does risk outside of security i i, I get quite irate when people in security make up new definitions of risk which we seem to do all the time <laughs> um, and, uh, i 100 agree off, guilty is, as charged we need to be very, very clear about what we're talking about when we're mapping risk. Yeah. Are we talking about mapping vulnerability? Are we talking about mapping um, harm? Are we talking about mapping an event with consequences, which is my preference? Um, you know, what what is it we're talking about? Because it just that word gets used for so many, so many problems that it's it's almost become useless in security terms because we don't. A, we we don't use the same word for the same problem. No, yeah, no, I do, I do agree with that. My, yeah, my, my challenge is usually I use the so what question. Mm -hmm. So if, if that event or that incident doesn't have a consequence for the business, why are we worrying about it? And if it does have a consequence, what's the extent of that consequence? Who's feeling the pain? Um, and and are they shouting? Yeah, it's 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 that degree of that's the. I hesitate to call it the rudimentary incident triage process, but that's kind of where we go. So here's the thing. Um, uh, we did the thing uh, uh, earlier in the week on application vulnerability scoring, and we very deliberately didn't call it application risk. Because what we were doing is we were saying, for the threat we're worried about, what is the how likely do we think they're going to be to be successful at, uh, attacking us, finding us, and exploiting it? At no point did we consider the harm that would come from that exploitation. We were purely saying, for this threat actor, do we think this, this vulnerability is going to be successfully exploited? Done. A little model, very simple. Not, not even actually much science to it. But it would have been very easy to say, here's an application risk method. And it's not. It's a vulnerability method. And vulnerabilities tell us something about risk, but they're not a risk. Mm -hmm. You know, they're a factor in risk. Yes. So I was going to say one other thing. So on the topic of adding more resources and helping, Greg, you're still on the call, right? Greg Mann, he, he helps to lead our testing. And I yeah. think the same way that, you know, when we talk about the ISGs that provide a great framework for us to think about, you know, what our engine does, I also think that the platform and the model that Phil created will give us a great common language to explain the risk and to explain, for example, the consequences and to explain how the multiple components of you know in this case our universe right fit together so i i highly um recommend you to take a very good look at it during work time and sorry sir i think i interrupted you <laughs> no 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 i was just saying i i i have to jump off now i've got to um go and um tell my eldest that she's going to bed right now so <laughs> <laughs>
and if I don't she won't so um and I did say I'd have a chat with her first so but the, I mean I could do do this conversation all night this has been fabulous really my brain's running 10 to a dozen so I will catch up with you all yeah. offline and, and by the way when we had the seminar this is exactly what happened but we were probably you know in the same room having some drinks with a barbecue and we'll still oh, keep gosh, going yes. so that's what happened oh don't no, that's summer. that's a mean to say thing to say during a pandemic that's just teasing <laughs> but anyway <laughs> take care everyone and i'll talk to you soon okay no, thank you for that Sarah. but you're not off the hook we will follow you up and uh, and and develop your diagram into a wardly map thank you yeah. thanks guys bye no, thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious how I've seen a number of people dropping off in the background. How many participants have we still got? We're in 12. We've got a dozen or so, haven't we? Okay. Both participants still. Uh, has been a who have we not? Of me doing also on the background the, the slides for the talk on Friday. <laughs> That's how it works, man. <laughs> and, and, and absolutely fine with that and i and i like the connection so phil you're on the schedule for two o'clock on thursday i believe at least according to my schedule um and uh, i'm hoping to make that um cool. i'm just having a look at who have we not heard from i don't think forgive me i'm going to pick on and i might get the pronunciation wrong Cillian lions has been quietly in the background as has Constantinos. I think I've seen Martin on the chat, but I'm not sure we've heard from Martin. Would any of those three like Jonathan. to pipe up? Oh, and Jonathan even. Yes, four. AJ. Uh, AJ, oh, cracky. AJ is not me for a change. Now that's good. Would anybody who we haven't heard from yet like to contribute anything? just to give you an opportunity. Hi there, yeah, it's Killian here. Um, I, find it, I find this talk very useful, thank you very much, and also very friendly and welcoming as well. Um, I'm, my primary role is of a security architect, and it is trying to, uh, I suppose, in, try to impart risk to both the business itself, but also the, the different uh, customers or service lines in the company that I actually am currently working for. Um, and uh, it's a kind of balance between obviously the, the technical side, but also the business side. And also add into that how we uh, inside the company consume um, services from uh, public clouds and use that internally. So there's a number of different things going on in terms of providing a platform for use, understanding your customers and understanding what offering you can make internally and the risks that are applied to those. And then also what the internal customers are using and the risks that they pose. And I think the term used for data was quite interesting about <clears throat> the, the toxic data as well because can <clears throat> because that that can be used whereby a lot of the questions that we would ask and one of the, the red flags would be what kind of data are you using and what are you using it for and that can dictate a lot of the actions that happen from that because we have to then look at controls we have in place and how of which cloud and which environment it goes into. So um, <clears throat> I'd very much like to be able to kind of work uh, and help assist with Sarah's uh, this, uh, I think, uh, project as well, because I think that trying to understand how you actually create the risk and also have a common definition of it as well, because um, the, uh, I have uh, experience obviously from the yeah, Asaka reference to, to risk, the FAIR reference to risk, and then also then the, the common, as well as the IRM uh, business risk uh, definitions. So there's a number of things going on. I'm just trying to basically try to get through all the different kinds of weeds and be able to try and get to a common understanding as how you manage risk and how we can actually communicate that 
to the business and, and to the customer. No, thank you, Killian, and I'll, and I'll take a volunteer over a press man, every, uh, sorry, press person, uh, every day of the week. So, are, are you on? Are you also on the Slack channel for this summit? And uh, not yet. I will join though. If if you could join, um, I think I think Denise, if we could, we could do with a subgroup, perhaps a channel here, and we'll we'll pull Sarah and Phil and Killian. Uh, and and some of the other vociferous contributors into that group so that we can um, fuse fuse the contributions. Absolutely, because because I as many channels as we want. Because uh, <laughs> I I think um, <laughs> I, I I think what we've been I'm going to say dancing around because I don't think we've actually been dancing, but I think what we have been contributing is is valuable to collect to show that we can use Wardley mapping to help the business with its risk-based decision-making. I think if you go back to where we started this, you know, that's kind of what I was hoping we'd get to, but I wasn't quite sure how we'd get there. I'm actually a little reassured that I haven't missed it, that, that we're not quite there. Um, but I think we've got some horsepower here that can, that can move it to the point where we could draw it. We could put it on a two-dimensional map. Um, but I'm just wondering whether a two-dimensional map isn't the right piece because we have complexity. But I think that's something we need to thrash out on that whiteboard to Phil's point. If um, if we can distill it to two dimensions and on a whiteboard, then uh, then then that's success. That's what success looks like. Um, okay, I managed to frighten off Constantine. I think I saw him drop. <laughs> uh, uh, would, who else is here? Jonathan or AJ? Can I put you on the spot or rather give you the yes, opportunity certainly. to use the mic? Uh, yes, certainly. It's, it's Jonathan here. Um, so I've, uh, at my previous company and in some standard stuff, I've bumped into multiple different definitions of risk. Uh, and going, going back to the session filled it on uh, on Monday, even just in terms of different viewpoints on how you measure, I'll say, technical severity of a vulnerability, so we don't overload the uh, the term uh, the term risk. Um, I am still very much a beginner on the Wardley map side of things, and I think I really enjoyed the conversation tonight don't actually have a lot I think I can add at the moment. Um, I'm probably gonna jump on the Slack channel and, and lurk in the background for a while, see what comes up. Um, but yeah, very interesting and thank you all for the dialogue. Jonathan, don't, don't worry about being a lurker. It's worked for me over many years. <laughs> thank you. Um, so and the whole point of the summit is exactly this. For me, this session represents what the summit is all about. You know, a number of people passionate about a, pro about a topic, hashing it out, sharing information. This is, this is really what the summit's all about. And one of my favorite sessions so far. Thank you for that, Denise, because I've not been at a summit before, so I don't know how, how this compares. <laughs> um, I suspect I'm not alone. Right, does anybody else want to take the floor and, and throw something into the ring? Because otherwise, I think we'll begin to wrap it up and let people. Um... Uh, just to say that in the chat, I have posted the, our Slack uh, channel. So everybody who wants to join, they can jo just join from there. And then we can create group or just uh, for your information, there is a Slack uh, URL. And actually, till the end, I was looking forward to see one worldly, ma worldly map in the session. <laughs> I was uh, thinking that there will be some diagram drawn even in this session, but next in the next session it will go. I, I, I actually I shared your your wish, but I'm not surprised that we haven't got there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I take solace from the fact that if if Phil is still thinking about how to get a risk in there as well as a value flow that tells me that actually this is an area where we should be putting some some effort such that we get to that point because i think um 
the beer collective benefit to move a lot of folks and a lot of enterprises forward off the back of this. So, uh, Denise, I think thank you for your contribution as well. Uh, I know uh, Mario and Avi and Tony have, have got elements of this, but I this this just feels to me like we've got most of the pieces, but they're they're in different parts of the table at the moment, and we need to bring them together to actually do that two-dimensional story. I'm perhaps being a little simplistic about it, but that's that's my feeling. Um, and I think we just need a bit of focused effort to create that Wardley map. And I suspect it won't be one. I suspect we'll end up with a number, but that's not a bad thing. Um, okay, let's um, let's begin to wrap this up. I know we're, we've lost a few more people um, I would like to thank those who are still here for seeing it out. That's two and a quarter hours um, late on the, uh, an evening, certainly for those of us in the uh, European theatre of operations. This has been a long day for those who are coming in from elsewhere. Uh, I hope your day is nearing its end soon, or perhaps it might even have just started. But thank you all for your contributions. I look forward to seeing uh, output from this, which we will share. Uh, and I think to the Open Security Summit's um, ethos about making sure that this is open and shareable, uh, I think this is one of those areas where um, uh, we should realize that. So thank you. And I look forward to the next output from this. Denise, is there anything else we should be doing before we close? Uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm looking for the guidance. <laughs> Um, I think a tactic was, was the idea to do like a little just summary or think that was a good one? Uh, we have like a, a to do a debrief for uh, up to five minutes, but I don't know if this session we like uh, need it. Um, if uh, we can do some summary, that will be great just for all what we discussed and what we expect uh, just uh, in two, three ballot points. Yeah. I yeah, just, just want to either Phil or Alan just give us the exact summary of the last two hours of conversation. Okay, that's a, that's a challenge, I think. I um, refer you to my blog. <laughs> 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 yes, if, if, for those of you who don't follow ORAC UK and the Black Swan blog, I'd commend you to do so. Um, Phil, yep. if you want to give us the correct URL, please do so. You'll be on a chat soon. Absolutely. Um, I think in terms of summary, I think um, we had some excellent contributions from Simon Wardley to keep us on track and in line with his, uh, his approach to Wardley mapping. Um, I think we're into it. We would appear to have discovered an area where there is potential to use the Wardley mapping approach. Uh, but it would appear that um, it's a work in progress. So I think we've, we, when we selected this opportunity, Denise, if I think back to sort of a month ago when we were thinking about this session, um, we, we knew it was going to be very much a working session. And I think we've, um, uh, we've, we've, we've ably illustrated that over this two and a quarter hours. Um, but it just feels like we need a bit of focus. And, and, I, and I think that's what we need to do next. Um, I think the, the idea of value flows and risk flows potentially going to different folks and different interests is, is an area that we need to nail. Um, the complexity of security, the multiplicity of users, interest groups, stakeholders is something we all wrestle with, um, which is where I think some, I think there's a, there's a need for that narrow escape, perhaps, of our Wardley map before we go to the, the one strategic uh, overlay. Uh, but perhaps that's me not being ambitious enough. Um, but we didn't have much in the way of silence. We had multiple contributions. Uh, we had good diversity of thinking and contribution. Um, but but all in English.
Now, actually, that's not true, is it? There were a couple of contributors that were not using English as their native language. So we, we even had some international contribution, which is good also. Um, and I'm starting to ramble. So I think, Denise, that's the end of my executive summary. I think <laughs> we have Please two Wardley fine. map groups that we want to take forward and get some output and use that to illustrate how you can use Wardley mapping to help a business tackle its risk-best decision-making. I think that was the start and that's where we'll wrap it up. I think you're a great host. We need, we need you more on these sessions. I think you, you really helped to guide the conversation and, uh, and did a great job there. Can I just uh, say I feel you. a lot better about not finding a solution myself and not being able to find any answers to these questions that I've been struggling with for months. And I feel better about not having that solved now, now that I see all, all the rest of you folks are still struggling with that too. So no, thanks, look, everybody. There, 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 there is that comfort in knowing that nobody's got the answer. <laughs> look, yeah, I know it sounds slightly, um, sounds, sounds slightly opposite thinking, doesn't it? But there is a comfort in that. I know some of I mean, us here are, mem are members, sorry, forgive me. Some of us here are members of the Club CISO group, which is sort of a peer group. And, and a number of us have actually found, uh, found it actually quite reassuring that we're not the only ones tackling a problem, that we don't always know the mm -hmm. answer. And we found that that group think that group share has actually helped us get to a better place. And I, that's kind of my hope for the Wardley mapping is to help me tackle that business conversation to nail them down because they always want to avoid taking responsibility because mm -hmm. then they'll be answerable to it. And that was one of the other things Phil quite rightly focuses on. Um, is, is there's just a little bit too much ambiguity in what it is we're trying to do. So I, I like the, let's use the common use of risk. Let's not try and turn it into a cybersecurity piece. Um, let's, you know, if the risk doesn't have a consequence, it's not a risk. Uh, there is the difference between risk and issue. We, interestingly, we didn't get into that this evening, but I'm in, I'm in danger of taking us down another rabbit hole. So I'm going to stop there and quit while we're ahead. <laughs> Either you need the recap also of what you said now. <laughs> I, I've just seen, I think I just saw uh, Phil shared his blackswansecurity.com URL with me uh, as for my bedtime reading. Well, I, I track it and I have an alert whenever he blogs. And if there's one person that's on Twitter more than any other, it does seem to be ORAC UK. Phil, I don't know how you do it, but hats off to you. Um, Basically, by not doing my day job, but uh, no, I, I, I tell you that one because I, uh, I mean, actually published it while we were talking. Oh, oh, in that case, I might not have seen it. So thank you for that. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I think, uh, and again, I, I would say, you know, this, this is exactly what makes the summit special, right? For me, this kind of session, this kind of conversation, moving the needle forward. You know, I have lovely memories of seeing things that literally start as a small little conversation in one summit getting a bit better in the next one, getting a bit better. And this is what we need to do. Actually, even as an industry, we need to do better at just collaborating and, and bringing all these ideas and knowing that none of us really have all the answers. And it's only by working collectively and sharing that we're actually gonna move the needle forward and really make a difference uh, in our industry. So thank you everybody. Uh, I think you can, Tatvik, you can um, pause the recording.